Good afternoon and welcome to the United States Institute of Peace. My name is Johnny Carson and I am a senior advisor here. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, the U.S. Institute of Peace was established approximately 35 years ago by an act of Congress. It is a nonpartisan institution whose objectives are to prevent, mitigate, and resolve conflict. It acts as a think tank, a facilitator, and as an implementer and trying to carry out its global mission of promoting and advancing peace. Today's program is focused on Ethiopia and the very remarkable and extraordinary developments that have occurred in that country over the past 15 months. Since taking power in March of 2018, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has undertaken an unprecedented and largely unexpected number of domestic, political, and economic reforms. After over 25 years of increasing authoritarian rule under the EPDRF, the country's dominant political party, Prime Minister Abe has opened up the country's political space. He has lifted Ethiopia's state of emergency, freed hundreds if not thousands of political prisoners, expanded media freedoms, and allowed the opposition political parties and leaders to return home. He has also made sweeping changes in the upper levels of government, dismissing many of the country's hardline security and military leaders, appointing women to half of his cabinet, and also creating a ministry of peace. On the economic side, he has promised to accelerate economic reforms, privatize a number of state-owned companies and enterprises, and also to break up METIC, the large holding company that was run largely by the governing party. He has also sought to strengthen existing regional alliances and to improve relations with Ethiopia's long-standing enemies and adversaries. After meeting with President Isaiah Shafawaki in Asmara, President Abe has restored Ethiopia's diplomatic relations with Eritrea and has agreed to implement a long-stalled agreement between the two countries, ending their 1998 to 2000 border conflict. President Abiy's blitzkrieg of reforms have been widely noted by those in the human rights and the democracy communities. They've been widely praised by those in the international community as well. But concerns are now growing that the euphoria around Prime Minister Abiy's changes are both masking and unearthing deeper problems inside of Ethiopia. A growing number of observers are starting to ask whether Prime Minister Abiy is simply moving too fast and whether the reforms he has initiated are generating instability and security and hostility in Ethiopia's ethnically-based federal system of governance. 
One of the most worrying of concerns is the resentment and resistance that is building up against him and his government in Tigray province, the home of Ethiopia's once all-powerful security chief, Kachacha Asfa. Although three arrest warrants have been issued for Kachacha, he remains free and at large in Tigray, where he is being shielded and protected by the regional federal authority. Ethnic tensions are also bubbling up in other parts of the country. Concern about the pace of change and reform has led two journalists who recently raised the specter that the political situation in Ethiopia could slowly deteriorate and that the country could experience the same type of ethnic, regional, and religious fragmentation that tore Yugoslavia apart two and a half decades ago. As we assess where Ethiopia is going, it is sometimes useful to look back to where it has been. Today we have a great panel of four former American ambassadors and former colleagues and friends who are going to share their insights about their experiences as the U.S. ambassador in Ethiopia. Uh, my colleague, Ali Vergi, will moderate uh, this uh, panel and will make more formal introductions of all uh, of our colleagues here. But just to say that we have Mark Bass, uh, who uh, was the first fully accredited U.S. ambassador after uh, the fall of the DERG uh, and after uh, the uh, escape of Mengistu uh, to Zimbabwe. And we have uh, Ambassador David uh, Shen, who followed him by two uh, tours, Ambassador Re Brazil uh, and Ambassador Don Booth, who many of you know uh, from his more recent position uh, as special envoy to Sudan. I'm going to relinquish the podium uh, and turn uh, the uh, microphone and the moderation over to Ali. Welcome again uh, to USIP and this discussion on Ethiopia. Well, thank you, Ambassador Johnny Carson, for those uh, opening remarks and for setting the scene for what I hope will be a very exciting uh, discussion today. Thank you all for coming to Nustalan. Welcome. And thank you very much to our panel uh, for being so gracious to reflect on your experiences. So just to perhaps present you a bit more uh, in depth for our audience's purpose, uh, seated directly to my uh, left, Ambassador David Shin, uh, who was uh, in Ethiopia from July 1996 to August 1999, and was also Ambassador to Burkina Faso. Uh, seated next to him, Ambassador Aurelia Brazil, who was uh, U.S. Ambassador to Ethiopia from November 2002 to September 2005, and also served as Ambassador to the Federated States of Micronesia and to Kenya. And seated next to her, Mark Bass, who we've heard already as the first uh, accredited ambassador after the fall of the Dirk, but was there also uh, for a year before that as the permanent chargé d'affaires um, from 1991 to 92. Is that not right? My first year was as permanent chargé, right. but I was, it was after the Dirk. Right, yes, after the Dirk, but before you were accredited as ambassador, yeah. And then uh, Donald Booth, uh, Ambassador Donald Booth, who was uh, U.S. Ambassador to Liberia and Zambia uh, before uh, going to Ethiopia. And then, as uh, Ambassador Carson has just said, uh, served as a U.S. Special Envoy for Sudan and South Sudan uh, before retiring uh, from the department. Thank you all again for, uh, for joining us uh, today. 
part of the purpose of uh, this discussion, as Ambassador Carson has said, um, is to look back for a couple of reasons, not only because going down memory lane is always an interesting thing to do, but because of the recurrence of so many of the themes that these ambassadors dealt with when they were posted in Addis and that Ethiopia confronts today, and we will touch on some of those subjects, democratization, elections, uh, political reforms of other kinds as well, the economy, the rapprochement with uh, Eritrea, these themes have recurred, they've repeated themselves, we'll come back to some of them again. This is not to say that we are facing, or Ethiopia is facing, an exact replica of those circumstances, but it is instructive, perhaps, to see how they were dealt with in the past, and also how the United States dealt with Ethiopia in the past, and of course there's a long and storied relationship between those two countries as well. So with that in mind, um, I think uh, the first thing we'd like to try and do also, given we have this experience uh, of many years of service um, in many different countries uh, across the, the world in this panel, is just to, to ask you, um, perhaps I can start with you, Ambassador Bass, being uh, chronologically uh, first, as well as alphabetically first. Um, what do you wish you'd known about Ethiopia before you'd been posted there? I mean, partly it's important, I think, for us to understand we know this is a difficult and sometimes impenetrable country. What do you wish you'd known before you had gone out there? You, you ended up being there very soon, very quick after your last assignment. And so what, what are your reflections on that point? Well, I guess I would say that the one thing that um, I wish I would have understood better when I arrived was the depth of the ethno ethnic identity in Ethiopia. I just come from Zaire, now Congo. And yeah, there's lots of ethnic groups, you know, 400, 600, whatever it is in Congo. Um, but it's, it's somehow, it's very different from what you find in Ethiopia, or what we found in Ethiopia when I, when I got there. Um, on reflection, I, I think that rather than just be ethnic groups in Ethiopia, it's more like certainly the three or four, depending how you want to count the Somalis, main groups are much more like like nations or like states, a little bit almost, not, not quite, I don't think, France and Germany kind of nation, but a little bit maybe like, um, uh, I don't know, Massachusetts and Virginia during the time of uh, the revolution and the first 40 years of the United States, where it really mattered. Uh, politics was a zero-sum game in a lot of ways, and I think it's that, it was that way in Ethiopia at that time as well. Um, and it mattered in the early years of the United States whether the president came from Massachusetts or the president came from Virginia. Uh, and I don't think it matters anymore, well, at least not quite so much in the United States. It still, I, I am pretty sure, uh, matters in Ethiopia. And I think that was the one thing that, um, that really surprised me. It was, it, ethnicity was almost a zero-sum game. They, everyone was an Ethiopian. But in their heart, they were Tigrayan or Oromo or, or something else. And um, I think, you know, when you look at it, ethnicity as a zero-sum game, if she gets something, that means I lose something. And that's not good for a country, obviously. Ambassador Brazil, perhaps I can put the, the same question to you. And what do you wish you'd known before you had gone to Addis? Well, I think I, I would have uh, benefited from having more time to get to know the diaspora in, in, in the U.S. In the US. Yeah before I went um, to Ethiopia, because they played an um, important role yeah. in what was happening inside the country. And I had not met enough of the diaspora and, uh, before, I, uh, before I left. So I think that would be my answer. Right. Uh, Ambassador Shin, when you were in Addis, what surprised you about dealing with the Ethiopians, I and mean, we'll come to some of the specifics later, but just as a general matter of the government being your interlocutor. Well, I think the one thing that I, I wish I had uh, a better understanding of um, in terms of doing the job that I was expected to do in Addis Ababa was to understand the, the mentality of uh, particularly highland uh, Ethiopians. I think there is a distinction to some extent between those who live in the lowlands and those who live in the highlands on the whole issue of compromise. Um, uh, 
it, uh, it took a while for me to figure out that uh, compromise came very, very hard to, uh, to Ethiopians. Uh, I was there during the beginning of the Eritrean Ethiopian War, and it, uh, it became apparent very quickly that um, uh, Highlanders on both sides of the border were um, not very anxious to compromise on any issue. And I think as Americans, where we do tend to be more willing to give and take on issues, we expect others to do the same. And when others don't do the same, we get very frustrated, uh, or perhaps we don't understand what's going on. Uh, after a while, I figured out that there just were going to be occasions when compromise was not going to happen, and you learn to live with it. But um, it was something I, I probably should have known earlier. Uh, Ambassador Boost, do you, do you share that view that uh, there's this difficulty with compromise? You were the ambassador most recently posted in, in Addis of our panel here. You were recently in Addis uh, yourself. Um, do you think that's still the case today, what uh, David Chin is saying? Well, I think the Ethiopians, um, if you look at it within the party structure of the EPRDF, which is a coalition of regional parties plus the allies, um, they do compromise. They have their gem gamma sessions. The party congresses go on for weeks and ultimately comes down to the EPRDF party congress. But once that decision is made, then policy, at least when I was there, was really locked in concrete. And there was no compromise beyond that. But within the party, they did find ways to compromise and, and overcome differences. And I think the, um, I agree that there's a very high degree of um, ethnic identity in Ethiopia. Uh, and that's really what um, Mellis uh, and his colleagues struggled with after they overthrew the Derg, which was how to try to govern a country and maintain stability so that they could uh, achieve economic development. Um, how to do that without the centrifugal forces of, of regionalism, uh, ethnic identity pulling the country apart. You've just mentioned uh, Mela Zanawi. Um, Ambassador Donny Carson, in his remarks, mentioned Abiy Ahmed, uh, the current prime minister of Ethiopia. Once upon a time, Mela Zanawi was also a young, bright hope uh, for the future. Uh, all of you dealt with him uh, during your time in office. Uh, Ambassador Bass, perhaps I can ask you, you dealt with Melis in the early years, and Ambassador Shin also, the, the relatively early years of uh, the EPRDF being in power. What do you take away from that experience in terms of dealing with uh, both Melis, the person, the EPRDF as an institution. Is there anything that's uh, relevant from that experience that you think is still uh, pertinent uh, today? Ambassador Bass? Well, I was there, as, as you say, I was there at a very kind of unusual time. And they had just arrived a month before I arrived. And so uh, the EPRDF and Mellis and everyone was, was finding their way uh, as much as anyone else. and. Um, I think people forget what was going on in the country at the time. I mean, there was the, the uh, former Derg army had been decommissioned or whatever the appropriate term is and were sort of wandering around trying to figure out what they were supposed to do. There were lots of refugees. There were lots of internally displaced. There was a huge humanitarian problem. Um, there were there was a whole issue of the transitional, uh, the national transitional conference or whatever it was called, I forget now, to set up some kind of government. There was the issue that was formally unsettled but actually settled of Eritrea. What was the relationship going to be between Eritrea and Ethiopia? And so I think, I mean, I spent, I, I was really lucky. I, I saw Mellis as often as I needed to and, and probably saw him two and three times a week which I'm guessing doesn't happen anymore. And it's not because I was brilliant, it's just because it was the way things were. Embassy was small, the government wasn't really structured. That was where the, the, the wisdom was coming from, such as it was. Um, I suspect and I hope that over the years, uh, and it sounds like now in the, in the present time, uh, the government has been revamped. There are, there are people at mid-level who you can talk to and, and in the party and, and, and elsewhere. Um, so. Um, well, what was I going to say? I just lost my train of thought. But anyway, I thought... I'll, I'll yeah, thanks. Uh, maybe we'll go to Ambassador Shin. I mean, you were also there in the relatively early part of uh, Melis's time in the EPRDF. Are there still lessons that are relevant today? 
Well, that's difficult to say. Uh, Mellis was a very unusual individual. The, the relationship uh, that I had with Mellis was, was I thought, a good one. Um, it, he was probably the only person in the Ethiopian government that you could go into, make your request, and get a straightforward answer immediately without having to worry about whether it was going to happen or not. Everyone else you met with in the government, uh, you made a request. If they didn't like the request, they would tell you, we'll get back to you, we'll raise it with the minister, we'll raise it with Mellis, we'll do something else. And it took me another six months to figure out that that was their way of saying, no, uh, we, we don't agree and we, we're not going to go along with it. But in the meantime, I wasted an awful lot of time uh, waiting for answers to things that never happened. Uh, Mellis was not that way. Uh, he obviously was more confident. He was in charge. He was fully in charge during the time that I was there, uh, which put him in a very different situation. Uh, I don't think you have had anyone in power since Mellis who has been in that situation. Uh, Haile Mariam certainly was not. Uh, he was uh, pretty much at the mercy of, of other members of the EPRDF. Uh, I'm not even convinced that uh, Abiy Ahmed is completely in that position. I, I, the EPRDF is breaking down as a, as a party. Uh, he, I think, has a lot of respect, more respect than any other particular person in the country. But he's, he's not in the same situation that Mellis was in. So I, I'm not sure that uh, what was going on during the Mellis period yeah. is, is really that relevant today. Yeah. Uh, would you agree with that, Ambassador Brazil? Not exactly. Mm. I, mean, I, I sort of picked up on what Don said about uh, the way decision making is made. I think people do. Um, I, I found Ethiopians very much like Japanese. Mm. I'll, I'll start there. And I served in Japan. And um, what I mean by that is that um, decision making in both countries, Japan and, and Ethiopia, is very slow. It's very slow to develop that consensus. That a lot of people have to talk to each other. It's an internal process. But once the decision is made, then implementation can come fairly quickly. Yeah. So I was very comfortable with the Ethiopian approach mm. to things because it reminded me of, of being in Japan in that sense. And there's also a practice in both countries of um, telling you what you want to hear on the surface and telling you what's underneath uh, in both Japan and, and Ethiopia. And, you, and figuring that out is helpful. Um, so I found my time there that, that the party or EPRDF people and other people were evolving mm -hmm. in their thinking although it looked very glacial. Can you, can you elaborate what place. you mean by the evolution of that? Uh, well, I think they loosened up uh, economically. Mm. Um, when I arrived, um, the, I'm not talking about the economic system, but when I arrived, there were 13 million Ethiopians facing starvation. Mm. There was a drought. And unlike the Dirk, they weren't trying to cover it up. Mm. So uh, I think the, uh, the US played a, a huge role at that time to provide food to ensure it came into the country and was pre-placed in di different parts before the rains came, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. But I think um, we worked with the government on that uh, to create the understanding among the donor countries as to what was going on, and then to refine the kind of requests that should be made. And then after that um, uh, sort of period passed, we worked with the government to suggest that they um, have an international conference right. to talk about how to deal with future um, such incidents, because they were coming yes. <laughs> in any event, and coming uh, faster. Um, on the economic side and the political side, I think there were some decisions to uh, begin to loosen up mm. on uh, the political side a bit. Um, I think the elections of 2005 surprised the EPRDF. Yeah. I think they felt people in Ethiopia, the Ethiopians, had a better understanding of what they had been trying to accomplish since they took over from the Derg. Um, and I think that surprised them uh, and made them clamp down. Yeah. Picking up on what David said, I think as an American, uh, we tend to go in and say, well, why don't you let the people have a demonstration and blow off some steam, and that would relieve the situation. 
um, just from our approach here. And their answer I was getting back from Ethiopian officials was no. You know, you don't do that here. If you have, if you allow people to have a, the slightest little demonstration, you're going to have a, an armed uprising or continued um, continued um, uh, demonstrations. So that the, the the reasoning was sort of different yeah. from the happy American who comes in and says, you know, let people blow off steam. Right. Um, so I'll stop there. And we'll, and we'll come back to the 2005 elections in a moment, because uh, there's a lot more to talk about there. But I first mm -hmm. want to ask you, Ambassador Booth, coming back to this question of, of Melis Zanawi and the EPRDF and any parallels that might exist with uh, Abiy Ahmed. You were there when um, Melis had already been in power almost 20 years. The later years of his uh, of his rule and the transition to Prime Minister Haile Mariam. What reflections do you have from that period? Do you see any parallels or any things that might be relevant to interpreting or understanding how Ethiopian politics plays out today? Well, I think we have to understand Melis in a bit of a historical context. Um, you know, David was there when he was fully in charge, uh, but we have to remember that uh, at the time of the war with Eritrea there was a major internal uh, upheaval, and Mellis kept his job really by a whisker. And I think that um, shook him up. Um, it shook up a lot of the hardline TPLF leaders as well. Um, then they had the 2005 election and the post-election violence. And that's why going into 2010, when I arrived about a month before the election, uh, I was really, didn't really understand the depth of paranoia that the EPRDF leadership had about a repeat of the 2005 post-election violence. And um, that's why when we would talk about free and fair elections, all they would hear is these foreigners are trying to incite violence and overthrow us. Uh, and that really carried through in how they dealt with us, how they dealt with all foreigners in that period. They wouldn't allow election observation. Uh, they, two weeks before the election, issued a decree that all foreign diplomats and international NGO personnel had to remain within Addis unless given explicit permission to travel. Uh, on the few days before the election, we had had a number of people that we were still planning to have be up country, not to be election observers, but to be up country. And Mellis called me outraged and said he would have them arrested as spies if he found any American diplomats outside of Addis. Um, Foreign Minister Sayum called me the day of the election to caution that there would be serious consequences in the bilateral relationship if we issued any negative statement about their election. And of course, we did issue a statement that did not see it as being totally free and fair. Uh, and there were consequences in the relationship. So dealing with them, I mean, at that point, they were really very, very prickly. Yeah. But Mellis, I always found to be, as David said, very straightforward. Yeah. Um, no meant no, yes meant yes, and no answer meant no. Uh, he told me that. I didn't have to wait six months to figure it out myself. He told me that early on. Um, and uh, he was very much into details. Uh, he was a detail guy. You could sit down and have great conversations with him. And, uh, but he was always very suspicious of foreigners and their motivations. And I think if you look back over Ethiopian history, there's a basis to understand why there's that suspicion. So for people that are dealing with the issue today and policymakers, I mean, what's the, what's the relevance of, I mean, that's what happened. You've described what happened. What's the relevance of that to understanding today's situation? Well, I think to understand today's situation, we, we see Prime Minister Abi making all these changes, and most of them we really like. You know, the opening with Eritrea, the release of political prisoners, the opening up of the press, but with this notion that we can somehow go in and really help him, I think we have to be a little bit cautious in that there are limits as to how much advice they're going to take from outsiders. Um, they will listen, but they will inevitably do it their own way. Uh, one example I can give of that was when I finally did convince Mellis that their logistics system in the country was really undermining the economy. It was like five times more expensive, well, twice as expensive to get a 20-foot container from Dubai to Addis than it was to get it from Dubai to Kabul um, at the height of the war in Afghanistan. So he indeed looked into that. He brought in some experts, and they looked at their logistics system, and their answer was 
we're going to combine three inefficient state-owned enterprises into one giant state-owned enterprise, which became hugely inefficient and resulted in costs going up and backlogs coming from the port. So even when you can get them to agree with you there's a problem, mm -hmm. And they may listen to you a little bit on the solution, but again, ultimately, I, I think they'll, see, they'll come up with a solution that's, mm. that's their own. Uh, several of you have mentioned uh, elections that you were either present for or preparing for, or when Ethiopia was preparing for it. I want to uh, quote some of your earlier uh, words uh, from your very useful uh, Association for Diplomatic Studies or Histories, which we have uh, from Basta Shin, Brazil, and uh, Bas. Um, David Shin, you had said, uh, about the 1996 elections, that the major issue was the democratization of the Ethiopian political system and where the government was taking the country on this question. So you, you were saying that about 1996. That easily could have been said or written uh, today. Um, Ambassador Mark Bass, you said about the run-up to the elections, I talked every chance I got to the government about making the playing field level and giving the opposition a chance. Again, words that wouldn't be necessarily out of place uh, today. Uh, I'll come back to Ambassador Brazil and the 2005 elections in a moment, but I want to ask you uh, both in terms of your views on the democratization process and given what you've just said, Ambassador Booth, about taking advice or how receptive they are to it. The 2020 elections that are upcoming in Ethiopia are seen as a very important policy priority, both for Ethiopia and for Americans dealing with Ethiopia. What are the lessons from those earlier democratic uh, processes, do you think? Um, Ambassador Bass? Well, we actually didn't have an election. There actually wasn't an election when I was there, but you know, just getting ready for the first one, the only election I actually had anything to do with was the um, Eritrean referendum, right. uh, which was a little bit, we were responsible for Eritrea at the time too. But the domestic elections were approaching. Either yes, they were approaching, for, yes, yeah. for sure. I mean, I think it's really about the process. I mean, it's obviously hard. Ethiopians have to do it themselves. They need to take um, ownership of the process. But I think we need to do all that we can to encourage them to make the process as open, as fair, as free as we can. This is, includes things like uh, free press and uh, an election board that, you know, that actually allows opposition to, to uh, campaign and trying to limit um, government uh, use of, I don't know, fertilizer to make sure that uh, farmers vote for the, the right party, whatever the right party is. Um, I think we have to really work on the process. I think if we go in there and say, this election must be fair and free, we're going to be disappointed. And, and it's not going to really help. I think it's, it's not easy to have fair and free elections. We don't have arguably fair and free elections in the United States, um, a lot better than, than other places. So I think it's really important to work on the process, and I think we need, again, going back to what Don said, you need to have the government on board, obviously, or you, it, you can't go out into the country, but I think we can use the whole international community. Uh, when I was there, we were doing it not for the elections, but for um, humanitarian assistance, and we had a big um, international group that sat down and, and decided how we could do this as a group and make make our resources most effective. And I think you can probably do that on the election side as well. Yeah. Uh, Ambassador Shin. You know, I think it's important to understand that in more than 2,000 years of Ethiopian history, there's only been one election in the country that has ever approached uh, what we would consider in Western liberal democracy as a free and fair election. And that was 2005, and that one was also very troubled. Um, the opposition, some in the opposition claim they actually won the election. I don't, I'm not sure I agree with that, but anyway, that's their claim. I think the lesson from all of this is um, with this 2,000 plus years of history, even with a, a new leader who is certainly saying and doing a lot of the right things and moving the country towards uh, what I would define as more of a Western liberal democracy, it's going to be very hard to overcome. Uh, this background, and I think that's one of the things that uh, Abiy Ahmed is, is encountering right now. How do you move forward uh, with all of these good thoughts that he has uh, 
uh, when one, you don't have a census yet uh, in order to even base an election on in terms of dividing up the country electorally. Uh, I'm, I'm not totally convinced that it's going to make a lot of sense to have national elections in 2020. Uh, the country may not be ready to really do a decent election in 2020. On the other hand, if you keep postponing it, uh, you keep frustrating people. So we, there's a lot of history that yeah. has to be taken into account yet. But um, in both of those answers, I think we've heard things that wouldn't be out of place if they were said today, having a free press, having a uh, focus on the process, recognizing that expectations have to be realistic. At the same time, every election that um, you all dealt with, similar sentiments were expressed. And Ambassador Brazil, you said in the, in the past that um, you don't think you can impose a democracy from the outside. You have to see what's organically developing and encourage those developments uh, towards democracy. Uh, again, that would be something which would fit very much with the current situation. You were the ambassador during those 2005 elections that uh, David Chin's just mentioned. <coughs> there is still that controversy about what happened. But beyond the controversy, I guess the important question for people to think about today there are many Ethiopians, most Ethiopians, in fact, uh, who are alive today, don't have much of a recollection of that 2005 process. They're younger, and they weren't voters at the time. As David has said, this was uh, a competitive election. Do you see lessons from that experience? Are there things that you feel from the outside might have been different uh, or could have been done differently? Do you think the Ethiopian system has changed significantly or su sufficiently perhaps to allow for um, either something similar to occur or something different to occur? How do you see the landscape? Well, I think in 2005, uh, we had, uh, we, the U.S. and also other diplomatic entities, uh, established uh, observers, yeah. uh, worked with other outside NGOs, um, talked to the opposition, talked to the government. As I had said earlier, I think the government was very surprised by the outcome. Our message to the opposition <coughs> was that, particularly for Addis, you won, uh, take, take the seat, take the position, sit, sit in, in, in that seat that you won. The opposition didn't want to do that. Uh, the opposition had its strategy, as David said, to say they won everything and and the government said of course it won so you had that that standoff but you had a very a much more open process i would hope that um that uh, ethiopia can continue evolving that way mm. i'm not sure i th i was there happily at in in ethiopia at the 100th year anniversary of our diplomatic relations it, uh, we had them in 1903 and i was there in 2003 and I said publicly, privately, every chance I got, after 100 years, there is nothing that we cannot talk to each other about. Just, and that included human rights, that included elections, that included every issue that we might um, have come up in our relationship. And we did that with everyone. And we did it publicly as well as privately. I think for the aftermath of the 2005 election, and I happened to be chair at that time, of the um, ambassadors group of, of donor countries. I think we, by our public statements, which we drafted um, and got other uh, donors to sign up on, I think we, we prevented much more uh, violence and a breakdown of the system. Uh, I, that might be self-serving, I'm not sure, but I, uh, we certainly were very much just concerned about the loss of life. Mm. And a continuation of that, so we tried to dampen it down, and I think we did succeed in that. And and and, uh, but we didn't damp down the arrests, the subsequent arrests and detentions and uh, exiles and 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 other things that that happened after I left, but um, but preceded the pr preparations for the next election because the EPRDF decided it was not going to be that surprised again. Right. I don't know if they've evolved. I mean, as Mark said, you know, 243 years of American history, uh, we're still evolving. Certainly when the you know, founding documents were written here, I was not included as a black person. I was not included as a woman. Right. 
it took us over 100 years to get to women, and black people still aren't included, as far as I'm concerned, uh, sufficiently. So we're still evolving mm. as a democracy, and, and Ethiopia has to gene organically water the little shoots of democracy that are coming up there in their own way. Yeah. In my view, we can't impose it from the outside. I've never been in favor of that. Uh, Ambassador Booth, you've already talked about the, the legacy as far as it affected your time uh, of the 2005 elections. There was also, of course, an election after you left in 2015, uh, and now we're looking toward 2020. I suppose one of the important differences between 2005, 10, 15 uh, versus the upcoming one is the status of the EPRDF. That is different um, in some way. Maybe it's difficult for us to say exactly how it's different. But do you feel that given the change of the party and given what we said earlier about the importance of how the party and its chairman at the time was the interlocutor, was the person who could say, this is how we're going to do things, what are the implications of that uh, for both, um, let's say, broader democracy promotion goals that are, are um, shared by the United States and uh, other uh, like-minded countries, but also for Ethiopia itself? Well, after 2005, the lesson really learned was don't be surprised again. Yeah. And what they did was they really empowered the party. Now, my understanding really, uh, <coughs> at least when I was there, was that the leadership, Mellis and company, really relied upon the party to govern the country. I can recall one meeting where Mellis actually complained that he had inherited this imperial bureaucracy which was so ossified and, and unresponsive. Uh, and very risk averse and, and not what he needed to really change the country. So there was this reliance on the party. And that's the structural problem that we saw play out in 2010 when they won all but two seats in the parliament and 2015 when they won all the seats in the parliament. The problem is which local official, which Warada chief, Kabele chief, is going to lose their district when they have all the levers of power in their hand? And the answer is none of them are willing to. So. Going into 2020, I think you've, you've got an interesting dynamic because, as I understand it, in co recent conversations that I've had with a number of Ethiopian uh, interlocutors, that Abi is basically, as you put it, I think earlier, allowing the EPRDF to atrophy. Uh, he's not using it as really the power tool. But he doesn't have much of a governmental basis to rely upon either. Um, so this... Uh, hammer lock on power that the EPRDF had through all of its local cadres and all the allied parties, if they go into an election in 2020, I think the dynamic could be very different. And so what I think really is needed is they need to figure out if they're not going to have that party lock uh, going into the elections. How do you need to change election rules so that you might actually have a more equitable outcome, representative outcome of what people uh, want. And, and they have to address that structural problem. And you know, I understand there's consideration underway of rewriting the electoral law and all of that. I think that's going to be a very important area to try to engage with. Not that they're going to take our advice wholesale by any means, but, but it's a critical area to engage in. Could I jump in and say also for 2020, you'll have more, lit more people who are literate, mm -hmm. more people, uh, more social media, mm -hmm access and um, so there, that's a difference that didn't exist Absolutely. in 2005 certainly yeah. uh, for the election. And, so, and more people more generally I mean it's a bigger population. Yes a bigger population yeah. so that you have uh, that dynamic as well in terms of what information people have and, and how they plan to vote and act on it. But given the... Can, yeah, can I just follow up on that point a minute? I think that's absolutely correct. I mean one of the things that really struck me when I was there was how profoundly rural Ethiopia was. And of course this was before the internet was just kind of coming in and there was no social media and all that. And and villages and regions and so on were not exactly cut off, but were really, really on their own to a large degree and which which gave, if you want, power to to the local party, to the local ethnic group, to to whatever it was. And I think that now that that is being slowly probably dissipated with the advent of social media, with more literacy, with uh, more more knowledge about what's going on in the world, 
And remember, when in my time, they had just come out of a, a, a horrendous uh, war and, and, all, and all of that entails. So I think there are some possible bright, um, you know, lights that that might that might lead to a better outcome. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to be Pollyannish about this. I think there's huge issues yet, but I think we're in a different Ethiopia than yes. certainly when I was there. But given these changes in the context that you've just described, uh, do the policy prescriptions, therefore, thinking about it from a U.S. point of view, should they also evolve? I mean, Ambassador Booth, you just mentioned the electoral law, but beyond the law, are there other things you feel could be done or need to be paid attention to? I mean, obviously, the sort of template is there, but are there things that need to be more responsive to the, the changing context, particularly if the party is fractured, particularly if uh, you have the the uncertainty of what's going on in the regions? I don't know, Ambassador Shin or Ambassador Booth, you have views on that? Well, certainly uh, some of these things have already happened. Uh, political prisoners have been released. That's obviously a good thing. Uh, the media is opened up significantly. Uh, the government is in the process. They're not there yet, but they're in the process of making life somewhat easier for non-governmental organizations and civil society. Uh, this is all good. Uh, at the same time, this takes uh, the lid off of the pot, and it means that things can boil over that didn't used to boil over because there was, there was so much uh, pressure from, from security forces from the government to prevent these things from happening. So somewhere in there, there's a happy medium where you let all of these good things from a Western standpoint happen, uh, but that they don't get out of control on the other. And the one thing that seems to be getting out of control is at the local level particularly, are the ethnic relationships. And these are just um, creating problems all over the country without much regard for what the central government is doing about it or can do about it. And this is the worrisome part. Uh, and they're not confined to just one or two areas. They're unfortunately uh, happening throughout much of Ethiopia today. And I suppose on top of that, I mean, in any country where there is uh, multiple ethnic groups, there's the potential for uh, ethnic clashes. But what is perhaps different in Ethiopia is that you also have an explicitly ethnically federal state. I mean, that's how it's set up in the Constitution. So the big question, and I'm glad you mentioned uh, what you just did, uh, Ambassador Shin and Ambassador Bus. thank you for bringing up the rural nature of this, because I think that also feeds into this. But the big question here is, in some respect, do you think ethnic federalism is sustainable? Is this still a model that can work? And how does that look then in terms of all of the other uh, prescriptions or actions that may be necessary to pursue? I mean, it's a big question, but it's an important one for the country. Well, I think that's the fundamental question that Ethiopians need to address. Because if they don't address the structure of their country, they can't have a successful election, they can't move the economy forward, security will continue to deteriorate. You already have 3% of the population who are internally displaced because of ethnic tensions, uh, displacements. Um, I personally think that a federal structure in a nation that has I very different uh, identities for its different components makes the most sense. Now, most opposition parties in Ethiopia, at least while I was there, their main complaint was this was a divide and rule tactic by the minority to grants. Uh, if you keep everybody separate, then you know you can rule. Well, what's the alternative? I mean, if you look at the history of Ethiopia, it's a series of strong rulers at the center, usually from the Amhara region, uh, but the highlands, who managed to cobble together a kingdom or an empire, and then maybe when the ruler is a bit weakened or there's a weak successor, you have rebellion from the periphery or attacks from the outside, and it all collapses. And then you need to wait for another strong leader to put Ethiopia back together again. This is a fundamental issue that I think Mellis was grappling with. Uh, I was told that there were many, many late night, all night sessions he had with um, Huntington of uh, Clash of Civilizations fame. Uh, discussing how do you structure a government in this country. Mm -hmm. And what came out of it was ethnic federalism. Now, I've had Ethiopians tell me, well, we should just have a normal federal structure like the United States does. And I say, well, how do you draw state boundaries? I mean, those have already been drawn by long history of, of ethnic groups. So, you know, ethnic federalism is probably the least worst uh, option in my mind for long-term stability in Ethiopia. 
just if I could add one little historic point to that. I, I think that when, I think what you said is, actually, is, is absolutely on the money. When, when Mellis was first in Addis Ababa, had the transitional conference going on, the national conference going on, he clearly feared a descent into civil war. He clearly feared that somehow, um, I don't know, the Oromos wouldn't be happy or the Amharas wouldn't be happy or something would happen. And, and he knew that the last thing Ethiopia needed after the long war that they just got over with was another war. And so I think he did kind of fall on this, maybe just out of expediency, maybe there, you know, it was the least bad choice. And I, I think it made a lot of sense at the time. I'm not convinced it makes sense 30 years later, but here we are. I might, I might just add, I, I had a, a meeting with Mellis after I had been ambassador. It was probably in 2006, maybe 2007, and I asked him specifically if he was convinced that ethnic federalism was the right policy for Ethiopia. And his response was kind of interesting, almost typical Mellis. Uh, he said, look, uh, Mr. Ambassador, we, uh, we've, we tried uh, authoritarianism, we tried imperial rule, uh, we tried communism under the derg. We tried uh, military rule, and none of them worked. So we've got to try this one now. And his final remark was, and I'm convinced it will work. Uh, I, at the time, was not totally convinced that this was the right approach. I'm even a little bit less convinced today. But his, uh, his response was an interesting one, that um, we're going to try something different. Well, I, I would speak up, too. I think, to me, it was a very practical decision they had to make at the beginning of the process because they did have armed groups around the country, and you're trying to, to knit uh, people together. <clears throat> I traveled to all of the, the uh, nine regions when I was there to find out what was going on, and I found at that time that the local officials were feeling much more empowered they could uh, speak their own languages in that region. They were getting some budget money uh, from the federal government, and they could decide how to allocate it. So there was this sense of we are not going to have the central government mm -hmm. telling us what to do anymore. We've got uh, some modicum of, of control now in our region. And I applauded that. The second thing I'd say is, uh, when I got to Ethiopia, one of the first questions I asked of many, but I consistently asked it of Ethiopians and anybody I met, was how do you put pressure on an Ethiopian? That was my question. I got various answers, but I decided that um, ultimately, uh, putting all the answers together, that Ethiopians really like to operate off of principle. Mm -hmm that uh, while there are some people in Ethiopia who would like transactional diplomacy, it's really principle. And so I think if, if they continue to have discussions internally about principles, the principles of a free press, or the principle of eth ethnic federalism, of what does that mean in terms of uh, the principle of being uh, voluntarily a part of something bigger, that principle. So if you can couch things as principles, I think that might open up a, a discussion in an interesting way, um, and that would uh, move things forward, too. Yeah. Could I just add that, you know, to caveat my remark about ethnic federalism probably still being the best solution, it doesn't mean it's the ethnic federalism that I saw in operation in 2010 to 2013. Yeah. Um, there's, a, you know, at that point, the security forces, the security service, the secret service was all dominated by one ethnic group. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't like to hear that, but it was true. Um, and so, you know, a more equitable uh, sharing of power within that structure, I think, could alleviate a lot of the shortcomings of it. And, you know, perhaps even a, a looser uh, federation is what might work. Uh, but right now, what you have is parts of the country. Uh, you have local, regional nationalism rearing its head, mm -hmm. uh, and not even the regional governments being completely in control of some parts of their regions. This is particularly true in Amhara and Oromia. But some people would say that is a looser, weaker federation, right? The center is weaker. You've got this. This is the result of what's happening um, outside. So how do you reconcile that uh, that problem of what's going on in the regions with what you've just said? Well, the other, the other part of the equation, and I think we'll get to this, uh, is the economy. Um, 
with the population growing the way it is, you know, they have to accommodate, I think it's two to three million people a year and newcomers into jobs. Growing the economy was, frankly, in, in developing the country, was what Mellis and EPRDF really focused on. Yeah. After the 2010 election, they breathed a huge sigh of relief that they had weathered this, they were in control politically, and now they could really concentrate and had the growth and transformation plan, number one, and it has been followed by number two. Um, they took that opportunity to mobilize the country to do what had been unthinkable in the past, which is build a dam on the Blue Nile, mm -hmm. using just Ethiopian resources, because they realized no foreign country was going to cross Egypt and, and put money into it. Um, they, uh, the, the, the single-minded focus was on economic development. And this goes with the philosophy, and I'm not saying I agree with it, but I want to explain it briefly of revolutionary democracy and the developmental state. You need revolutionary democracy, which basically means one party rule, in order to maintain sufficient stability and a sufficient focus on economic development so that you could create a middle class, which they viewed as a precondition for liberal democracy and free and fair elections. And it, the idea was once you got that to that middle class, that then, sort of in the you know, communist theology, the, uh, the the state would wither away, and and you know, you'd have this wonderful uh, utopia. Um, it would be liberal democracy, and people would be rich enough, smart enough, educated enough, empowered enough uh, to be able to make the fundamental political change in the country. That was the rationale that they were operating under during the period I was there. Uh, Ambassador Shin, do you think that uh, logic still applies? I mean, the developmental state is still uh, effectively the framework. I mean, it is uh, it is perhaps changing. Uh, but for all of this time that Mellis was there, Heilemarin was there, that was the, the, the mantra. You had the very high official growth rates, at least, and uh, very visible economic development, at least in some parts of, uh, of the country. I mean, how much does the economic situation affect the quality of political reforms, do you think, that could be contemplated now? Well, certainly the economy has a major effect upon uh, the political future of Ethiopia. I, I'm not sure that the, uh, the template is the same yeah. now. Uh, I, I think it was the same under Haile Mariam. I, th I think basically the economy was operating under, under Mellis autopilot uh, yeah. after Mellis's death. But now that, that Haile Mariam is gone and Abiy Ahmed is in, in charge, I think he's, he has his own ideas, or he and, and certain people around him have their own ideas about how to move forward. I think they, they probably want to see high economic growth rates, uh, as Ethiopia has uh, claimed it has had for the last 15 years or so. I was at a session yesterday with, a, uh, with an Ethiopian opposition uh, representative who was sort of making fun of, uh, or poking fun at Ethiopia's 11.1% uh, growth rate, annual growth rate for all of the last 15 years. Doesn't change, it's 11.1% each year. Well, one, he, what he said is not totally true. It's, it, the government doesn't claim that it's been 11.1% for every year for the last 15 years. But the point is that they have been claiming a very high GDP growth rate, probably higher than it really is. But the fact remains, it's still been very good. Uh, even if it's in the single digits, it's in the high single digits, and that's very impressive. And I think uh, Ethiopia and, and all of the economic leaders in the country who are responsible for its economic growth deserve credit for that. Uh, I, I, that's not sustainable. Uh, at some point, it's, it's going to become a more moderate growth rate. And I think Abiy Ahmed is committed to that, but um, whether he's going to follow the same pattern, uh, I doubt. I, I, I see signs of, of certain changes in, how, in his economic policy uh, that is opening the economy up to some extent, not entirely. Uh, foreign banking is still not allowed in the country. Uh, there's total control of, uh, of IT and the internet, uh, so there are some really serious issues out there yet. But uh, I do see change coming, and uh, the, the question is, can he, can he keep it all together? And, and what's your answer to that? I mean, can it work? I mean, the, the rhetoric of change is it, there. It can. But. I'm not saying it will. <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't know if you share that view, Ambassador Brazil. Well, I would throw out uh, demographics as well. Mm -hmm. And demographics really is the future that's already happened, so that with 50% of the population below 
the age of 15. Uh, you know the kind of bulge you're going to have. You know the kind of jobs that you're going to have to create. And um, one of the things I've been working on with uh, diaspora members and, and, and others is to uh, start a, an American university in Africa cited mm -hmm. in Addis because I think you have to educate the people for different jobs. You can't export folks to other countries any with ease any longer uh, after recent experiences uh, globally. And so uh, they've got to um, provide that educational foundation to give jobs to the people. So they, they, yes, there will be changes. And I don't think they'll ever, well, I don't think it'll, in my lifetime, uh, get the state out of the economy. Uh, I think they see a role there that they will retain, but they will loosen up, uh, and they could do it successfully. I could just, <clears throat> sorry. If I could just add, um, I visited Ethiopia five years ago and took my family around all out through the through the country and through the countryside, which I hadn't done since I'd been there uh, as ambassador. And the one thing that struck me was that the economic activity in the countryside was much much greater than it was mm -hmm. when I was there. Now it was it was yeah. nearly zero when I was there. So uh, you know you're coming from a small start, but. I think that we, we can't forget agriculture. I mean, everyone wants to you know, be an entrepreneur and be the next uh, apple of Ethiopia or whatever it is, but I think we can't forget agriculture, particularly with the population uh, situation, population demographic that is coming down the, or is already there. Mm -hmm. uh, and by that, I don't just mean you know, growing teff, but I mean the kind of things that I saw, which were, I don't know, uh, food processing and flower plants, and I know some of it's got foreign connections and, and may not be all that much uh, value added, but I think you need to work on getting those sort of things in agricultural areas that people can, where people can get jobs, that use the agricultural resources of the country, and that bring more value added to the country, not necessarily to Chinese or other uh, um, foreign firms, America, whatever. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago, the U.S. government supported this uh, investment forum specifically mm. on Ethiopia. I wonder, in light of what you've heard, Ambassador Booth, if you have a view as to, given the realities, the demographic realities, the structural realities of the economy, what Ambassador Booth just said about the, the, the need for considering that Ethiopia is much more than its urban areas as well. At the same time, we know that it is rapidly urbanizing. What makes sense in your mind for a U.S. policy which is also explicitly focused now on promoting trade, investment, and on economic ties um, coming to perhaps uh, more of a prominent position than they have been in the past? Well, again, I'll go back to a structural problem. And I talked about the political structural problem. There's also an economic structural problem that basically relates to the political system which is you have too many state-owned enterprises, mm -hmm. uh, too much of the military engaged in things like MITEC, uh, which now they're trying to break up. Um, massive projects like run by the Sugar Corporation, which were huge money losers. Um, and and the, the problem you have now is you can't just go and privatize things um, because what foreigner is going to come in to run something in Ethiopia, to sell to Ethiopians for the most part, I'm not talking about manufacture in Ethiopia for export, but to deal with the local market. For example, telecom, which is primarily a local market. If you don't have any foreign exchange that they can then use to repatriate their profits. So I think structurally, one of the things the government needs to work on, and perhaps we can lend some ideas in that regard, is how to sort of begin to demonopolize, de-oligopolize the economy. Uh, allow more competition, allow Ethiopian entrepreneurship to flourish. It used to really frustrate me when uh, people would say, we need to teach the Ethiopians entrepreneurship. I said, have you ever been in Washington? <laughs> <laughs> You just, Ethiopians are naturally entrepreneurial. So let's forget about teaching them how to do that. Let's give them the opportunity to do that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the, uh, the things that, that strikes me, um, I visited a Turkish uh, textile factory uh, where they were manufacturing garments for export. And the biggest complaint uh, was there's no supporting infrastructure. So 
I had to bring in some of my own workmen to do the type of building that I needed for my factory. Of course, I had to import all my machinery because none of it's manufactured locally. But I then had to create my own cardboard box manufacturing company because there was nothing locally that I could just buy from. Uh, there was, I had to, in effect, set up my own bus company because there was no one that I could really rely upon to provide transportation for my workers. This all adds to the cost of production and it deters foreign investors. You add to that the fact that the banking sector remains 100% Ethiopian. Uh, the idea of getting international firms to go in there when they can't deal with their own bank uh, is something that's a deterrent not only to Western firms but also to Chinese firms. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, the inefficiencies in the telecom sector um, also mean very difficult to do business. I mean, when I was there as envoy for Sudan, South Sudan, uh, several times the internet was closed. Mm -hmm. uh, once because of the state of emergency, once ostensibly because the national uh, university exams had been stolen. Uh, so the entire internet was shut down for days at a time. How do you process credit card transactions when the internet shut down? How do you make airplane reservations? How do you make orders, conduct business? Um, this was a real problem. Now, in discussions I had with Mellis, there was a lot of focus he had on protecting the small holder, the small mom and pop business, the small subsistence farmer. Because he realized if he took any policy actions that would put them out of work, he'd have a revolution on his hand. So, you know, how do you open up the economy um, without harming those interests uh, is, is a really delicate, delicate question. But the key thing, I think, is to break up the monopolies and the oligopolies. <coughs> is that something that you think applies um, outside of Addis as well as an approach? I mean, I want to extend this also beyond the economy. I mean, Master Brazil, you talked about the importance of getting out and going around, and you went to all nine zones. I think everyone uh, here has also commented in the past on the importance of understanding what's going on outside of Addis, beyond Addis, uh, traveling in the country. Of course, that's diplomatic practice as well, where, where possible. Partly, I suppose, the question is now, with the difficulties that are persisting and emerging in regions beyond Addis, understanding what's happening, with whether it's with the economy, whether it's with local politics, whether it's with the security situation, how can one do this effectively and break through this Addis bubble? Do you, do you have thoughts on that? I don't know, Ambassador Brazil, perhaps. Well, we had uh, programs, uh, USAID programs when I was there that, was, that were aimed at creating markets mm -hmm. outside of Addis, out in the, in the rural areas. Uh, working on transportation linkages so that people can move their goods mm -hmm. to a, a larger um, uh, town, uh, that kind of thing. So you, you are, at that time, we were starting sort of at the very basic levels, yeah. but we were having some uh, result. I think you, we, outsiders need sort of sustained programs, mm -hmm. not sort of the flavor of the day that might come in that will have uh, some effect because the people there are very smart. They catch on very quickly. Um, you, you can have training and then people can run with what they learn and keep it up to date and they work on the national government to, um, to uh, remove the structural mm. problems. But we had AID programs around the country. Ambassador Shin, what, what are your views on how to get beyond the Addis bubble and trying to understand what's going on, whether it's relevant to economic development or indeed other fields? <coughs> well, this is a, a topic that really gets me off on my hobby horse, um, and that is the whole question of what um, has happened in the American Foreign Service as a result of security problems, uh, largely stemming from 9-11. Uh, I was I finished my time in, in Ethiopia in 1999, so I was there during the attacks on the U.S. embassies in uh, Nairobi and Dar es Salaam, mm -hmm. which started to have a significant impact upon the ability of embassy personnel to get around countries uh, in Africa. Um, it got much worse after 9-11. I was I retired at that point, but I get back to Ethiopia every year or two and, and have a pretty good feel for how much movement there is by, by embassy staff in Ethiopia and other embassies in Africa where I sense a very similar problem. Uh, by and large, the, um, the security tail is wagging. The 
the diplomacy dog these days, and people are simply not getting around to the extent they used to get around. I made a point of getting out of the embassy for at least one week out of every month, traveling all over the country by road, usually by road, occasionally by aircraft. And it made a huge difference. Um, you, you, it's the only way you can really learn a, a country as complex as Ethiopia. It's to get out and meet with people constantly. And I think in our foreign service today, that is becoming increasingly hard to do. And I think it's not necessary that we have such strict security regulations. There, there's an added problem in terms of Ethiopia in that they're getting so many high-level visitors out there that the senior staff are just consumed by hand-holding, you know, every Tom, Dick, and Harry who wants to say he, uh, he has met with the Prime Minister of Ethiopia. So that's a, that's a problem I didn't have so much of. We had two Secretary of State visits, but that's nothing compared to what people get out there today. So if you're the ambassador to Ethiopia now, uh, you're constantly dealing with all of these these uh, visitors, most of whom would be better off to stay home. Uh, and, and you're also having to deal with a security problem, which is totally inexcusable. And it's not going to change until someone at a very high level in the administration decides to change it. Uh, I was at a meeting of the Academy of American Diplomacy uh, uh, two days ago, and, and they have taken this on as an issue on Capitol Hill to try to get changes in the ability of, of embassy personnel to move more freely around countries globally, not just in Africa. <laughs> Uh, Ambassador Booth, I want to ask you the same question. It's always refreshing to hear uh, unvarnished views from uh, people who are <laughs> free to speak. Um, not only did you serve in Ethiopia after 9-11, after Dar es Salaam and Nairobi, but also after um, the bombings that occurred in, in Addis, um, uh, coordinated attacks um, that happened. And of course, that, uh, the, the, the scourge of terrorism is always sort of lingering. What's your view? Um, there's that reality of what the State Department's security restrictions are, etc. But in terms of understanding or trying to understand what's going on, and particularly now, you've just been to Ethiopia. Um, how do you see that, uh, that issue? How can one effectively understand what's going on beyond Addis and beyond, say, the Prime Minister's level? Well, let me say, first of all, that uh, David certainly set a very high bar, and I was quite aware of, of his extensive travels in Ethiopia when I went out. And I was not able to do a week a month by any means, but I did get to all 10 regions, and many of them several times. Uh, what I found was it was repeatedly going back and engaging the key people in, in a region that made the difference. And particularly, I focused on the Somali region, because it was one of the areas that was most unstable, where we had the most human rights concerns because of the continuing uh, conflict with the ONLF. Uh, and I think uh, my multiple visits out there engaging the Somali president uh, actually did begin to pay off, uh, and that there was a degree of trust and, and real dialogue that we were able to establish. Uh, but it's, it's repetitive, it's being out there. Uh, I agree that just flying in and flying out is less desirable than actually at least going one way on the ground, so you truly get a, a sense of, of Ethiopia and its diversity. Um, I found that the security problem was not so much in keeping us from going out, uh, and maybe I benefited from the fact that I knew any time I went someplace that the Ethiopian government was going to make sure it was safe. Uh, I can remember being held up at the airport in Addis for hours waiting to go to the Somali region until they got the okay that Everybody's, all the bad guys are, are, you know, we know where they are, so you're not going to have a problem. Um, but the, the problem really was allowing Ethiopians to access our embassy. Uh, and when we put our information resources, our library, et cetera, behind those walls, uh, it truly is a deterrent. Um, but getting out, uh, you know, is, is absolutely critical uh, to understanding Ethiopia. Um, and I think... Uh, now the, the, the problem is, and what I've heard uh, is that because of the increasing insecurity throughout the country, that that's what's deterring uh, more embassy travel as much as all the visitors that, that David mentioned. Mm. Uh, but there are places now where the, it used to be you couldn't go near the Eritrean border. Right. And if you went to the far south, then you know you had to make special arrangements. But that was about it. Every place else was pretty much you could go. Embassy officers would go, I would go. Uh, but now that's being restricted more and more. 
but at the same time reporting on this insecurity, understanding this insecurity is a key uh, programmatic diplomatic objective, right? So how does one do that if, oh, we can't go there because uh, it's too insecure to go there? I mean, this is a challenge to, to all of you, really. I mean, if you have views, yeah. Well, one of the things that, that I was very fortunate is that we had a number on the USAID staff, a number of long-serving uh, personal services contractors, um, one of whom was married to an Ethiopian from a, a marginal region. And so uh, these gentlemen enabled me to have a m really good understanding of those particular regions, was able to introduce me to people in those regions. Uh, they would always travel with me when I went to the regions of their expertise, which was Gambela and Somalia. Um, and I encourage them, in effect, in effect deputize them, if you will, as uh, political advisors. The aid director was not always happy that I was using them for those purposes, but uh, I found that to be very effective. Mm -hmm. You think the local staff at the embassy might also be helpful, but frankly, they're all from Addis, uh, or just about all from Addis, so it's not, not particularly helpful in that regard. I should mention uh, meeting with women mm -hmm. as well uh, in Addis and, and also around the country. Women know what's going on. Uh, usually better than the men sometimes and um, I think um, so whenever I went out I, I met with women and when men uh, I remember one uh, woman was hosting a luncheon in the Somali region for me and she turned out to be uh, to have control of the cot trade <laughs> so we could talk economics and social issues and other things uh, because she she controlled it herself and her husband was there but he didn't seem to be doing much uh, well, was, of that the, uh, maybe yeah. yeah chewing cut I'm not sure but anyway she was very sharp so I just throw out that women um, are, are people to meet and I always took a, a group of people from the embassy uh, with me not a large delegation but people from different sections who might have business Gambella was one area we went to after the they had some violence there, so that that was something that seemed to be a little sensitive with the government. But I agree, the government make sure that you were safe. Uh, we were safe traveling around. But there, I could talk to the people involved in all sides of the violence, as well as the women, mm -hmm. to find out sort of what would, what had happened and what might uh, continue uh, happening, and, and also cross border from uh, Sudan. Ambassador Voss, you wanted to add something to that? I just was going to sort of state the obvious, which has kind of been hinted at here by my three colleagues, but I, obviously it's, it's, it's great to get out. The best thing to do is for the embassy and embassy personnel and diplomats to talk directly to people in the regions. But if you can't do that because of security, because of overwhelming numbers of visitors from Washington or, or whatever the problem is, the, the obvious sore resource is, as Ree mentioned, people like aid officers or NGO officers, or you can't maybe influence policy in the region, but at least you can find, you get the other part of it. You can find out what's going on in the region or, or regions. And I mean, it seems to me that that's a resource we shouldn't, we shouldn't ignore. No. Can we turn to uh, foreign relations for, for a moment, and specifically perhaps Eritrea? The rapprochement with, uh, with Eritrea um, has been one of the perhaps the most important achievements of uh, Abi's tenure so far. We have people here who were ambassadors before things went badly with Eritrea and after. I want to ask first um, David Chin and Mark Bass, uh, both of you were there before the war with Eritrea. The relations in those years were, were not bad. They maybe, maybe weren't perfect between Addis and Asmara, but they, they were there. Afawerki, as uh, Ambassador Carson has mentioned, still very much there at that time as well. Are there lessons from those dealings and how relations functioned between Asmara and Addis in those years that are relevant in this new era of rapprochement, do you think? Why don't you go first? <laughs> Well, that last part of it's a kicker. Um, yeah. Well, my first two years there, we didn't have an embassy in Asmara, so I spent, I probably went to Asmara 25 times because mm -hmm. we were responsible for what was going on up there as well. So I got to know Isaias pretty well. Um, and I think that Isaias and, I mean, Eritrea is, a, it's like the big brother of the Tigrayans, I think. And they, they helped the Tigrayans from their point of view win the war. And then all of a sudden the Tigrayans, 
won and they had this big Ethiopia, which they didn't really maybe expect to get when they started out. And I think uh, Isaias was not happy that he didn't have as, uh, as much influence in what was going on in Ethiopia as he felt he should have. Um, both Ethiopians and Eritreans are stubborn. Uh, Malus certainly wasn't going to be treated like anyone's little brother, mm -hmm. and uh, he was, after all, uh, president of the much bigger, or prime minister of a much bigger country, uh, much more populous, and so on. Um, and so, I think I think that's an issue, but or not an issue. I think that's that's a, that's the history of it. Um, I think what it can tell us for now is is harder. I think. I'm not sure what I can say. I think Isaias is erratic, and and it's hard to know uh, what he's going to do at any at any time, and therefore um, it's hard, I think, to have any certainty about what's going to go. I think what is happening now is the right thing. You've got to have exchange. You've got to have uh, open borders. You've got to try to to make it work. But I don't think it's going to be easy necessarily. Mm -hmm. But maybe with the Tigrayans, less in in the, 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 should I say, not, not in, the, in the Prime Minister's office, uh, maybe things will be better. But following along chronologically, uh, I was there before the war broke out in uh, May of 1998, and I was there throughout most of the war. And it allows me to make a point, which isn't the one you were raising, but I think it's an important point. And I, I can't overemphasize the degree to which that war changed the U.S.-Ethiopian relationship and the Eritrean-U.S. relationship. It totally transformed it, and almost overnight. Uh, the U.S.-Ethiopian relationship had been on a steady upward trend uh, from Mark's time until May of 1998. Uh, we, all of us who were serving there during that period benefited from this and that it was a very much of an improving relationship. There'd be little blips, ups and downs in the relationship, but nothing significant. That war broke out, and within a month or six weeks, uh, the U.S.-Ethiopian relationship was, was in the tank. Uh, it, it had just become very difficult uh, almost overnight, and the same happened in Eritrea with the Eritrean-American relationship. And the reason was really quite simple. Uh, each side, uh, Nellis for his side and Isaiah for his, felt that the United States was supporting the other side. It's this old business, if you're not 100% for me, you must be against me. And both Melis and Isaiah and the leadership elements of both countries felt that way. So immediately, uh, I in Ethiopia and, and my counterpart in Eritrea had a horrible time trying to interact with, um, with our respective uh, host governments. Uh, what that means in terms of the future, I don't know. Maybe, it, maybe it's irrelevant in terms of where we go from here. But it does underscore the importance of, of local and regional developments on the U.S. bilateral relationship with, these, with both of these countries. Uh, and it, it, it just absolutely overwhelmed the relationship. And we could say that the rapprochement today has probably helped the U.S.-Ethiopia relationship, yes. right? We've seen that that was a, a useful thing for, for building confidence here. So I will press you a little bit, David, in terms of going back to that pre-war period <coughs> where relations were good and now, again, between the two states, uh, relations are, are good. How can that be sustained? I mean, how many people would say that the war that happened in many respects escalated much more rapidly and dramatically than had been foreseen. And of course, we know it lasted for, for a long time thereafter, the, the, the Cold War between them. Are there lessons there? Well, first off, time does heal wounds. And uh, we, the U.S. got beyond this. I don't know whether it took a year, year and a half, two years. But uh, eventually, the relationship was, was uh, improved significantly. This I'd left by this time. Other ambassadors had come in. Uh, there were other ups and downs, I know, uh, during these subsequent years, but probably none quite as serious as the one caused by the Eritrea and Ethiopian War. What's, what's interesting, and this may be a lesson for some of you, if we have any future ambassadors out here, when you run into a situation like this, uh, it, it raises real issues as to what do you do with your time in a country when you know you've got another year or two to be assigned there, and you know the relationship is in the tank, uh, largely because of, of an event you have no control over, 
uh, and you can't do much about. And it was probably one of the smarter things that I did at the time. I decided to focus on trying to do something about HIV AIDS in Ethiopia. Totally neutral political topic, one that desperately needed attention. USAID had resources. They could put money into the program. Uh, they had experts who were more than happy to come out and, and try to ameliorate the HIV AIDS problem. Ethiopia was denying the problem. I mean, it was sort of a, a, something they just weren't seeing. And by, by working with a combination of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, the president of Ethiopia, not the prime minister, and, the, uh, and even the, the Muslim community and the evangelical communities in Ethiopia, we launched a really serious um, HIV AIDS uh, counter program. And it made all the difference in the world in terms of how I utilized my time and how the mission utilized its time. Without that, frankly, I would have been twiddling my thumbs out there for probably a year. Uh, Ambassadors Brazil and Booth, you both were there when relations between Addis and Asmara were not good. So I'd like to ask you both to offer any thoughts you have on anything that can be appreciated from those days, from that relationship. Is there anything that's still relevant today, given how new the rapprochement is and how tenuous in some respects it might be for a number of reasons, whether in Tigray, whether in uh, the mind of uh, the president of Eritrea, etc.? What do you see from that period that may be relevant? Well, um, I found on, on the border uh, areas, the communities there knew who owned what land. Yeah. Uh, the local community on the Ethiopian side would say, that, that pasture over there, that's Eritrea. And over here, this is, this is ours. Uh, so the, the local community seemed to be uh, more, not more knowledgeable, but but able to um, try to adjust that, that artificial line that had been drawn uh, by the commission uh, that, that cut off pastures or cut off roads or, or made people have to cross two borders just to get to town, that kind of thing. Uh, left to their own devices, I think that could have worked out. Um, but I know that by the time I got there, the, the, the issue was still there. Mm -hmm. Um, the Ethiopians were hoping the U.S. could do something about it. Uh, as Mark said, I think our suspicions of Isaiah's were such that we weren't convinced that um, anything could be worked out. But it, it didn't loom that large, except that we did send delegations there. We did go ourselves as uh, embassy officers and others to talk to local people to find out the, the situation. And there had been a, a couple of skirmishes here and there as well. But things are relatively peaceful and Addis, uh, the government in Addis wasn't uh, dwelling on it 100% of the time. They were more domestic issues. Well, I would say when I was there, it was a <clears throat> bit warmer. Uh, there were many instances where there were border incursions uh, and retaliatory border incursions. Um, at one point, uh, or at least, on, at least on two occasions that I can recall, uh, I specifically went in and cautioned against things getting out of hand, uh, making sure that there was no misunderstanding that the U.S. was giving a green light or even a yellow light to what might be done. It was a clear red light. Um, there was very much a tit for tat. I can remember Mellis telling me once, they killed 12 of our miners, the NDF went across the border and killed 12 of their soldiers, and then we withdrew, because we'd done it eye for an eye. Um, that was very tense. When Haile Mariam came in, he said something which was widely misinterpreted. He said, I'm willing to talk with Isaiah anytime, any place. And everybody thought, oh, this is the great opening. It was a lowering of the rhetoric without actually any change of the policy, which was, until you talk, we're not going to make any changes on the border. We're not going to respect the, the international arbitration. So Abi comes along, and he's not seen as, I mean, he's, he's seen as someone who has basically sent the, from Isaias's point of view, the hated Tigrayans off into exile. And so, yes, Isaias is much more open to this rapprochement with, with Abi. Um, but my understanding from my recent visit out there is that after the border being open for a few months, with tens of thousands of people crossing into Ethiopia, Isaias has decided to reclose that border. Uh, he can't let the whole gulag get emptied out. Um, 
So what's left in it now for Ethiopia? Uh, you know, playing a bit of a devil's advocate, maybe Prime Minister Abiy got played mm -hmm. on this. Um, Isaias has gotten greater uh, international recognition, receptivity out of it. Um, what has Ethiopia gotten out of it? Ideally, what they'd want is access to the ports. Uh, but as my colleagues have said, he, Isaias is a very um, erratic character. Who's going to make the investments in roads or railroads and port development for somebody who may shut it down over any perceived slight. So I'm not quite sure what Ethiopia has gotten out of it. I, I agree it's a, it's a good development, anything that will reduce tensions, uh, but I'm not sure that it's really solved the Ethiopia Eritrea problem. Well, thanks to the panel for putting up with my questions, but you're not off the hook yet. Um, we would like to give <coughs> the audience a chance to also raise questions that you have, but only questions, please. So please, uh, there are some mics, uh, both on the, the left and the right side of the room. Please tell us who you are, please ask a question, and please be concise. Thank you. So uh, the gentleman here in the front, and then the, the, the lady here. Uh, thank you for holding this, uh, Jordi Hannum, UN Foundation. I feel a little sheepish uh, saying this. I'm one of the uh, visitors who was just there, so I apologize. But uh, I was there uh, last week, actually, with a um, UNHCR delegation, and we took a congressional staff. Um, and my question is, we all kind of agree that the next 12 to 18 months is critical. And we met with US Embassy, USAID, and they all acknowledge that the U.S. could be doing more. Um, and I, I'm particularly interested from you all, what ways, what kind of specific ways could the U.S. help in terms of the next 12 to 18 months? Dollars, election observers, what are the tangible things the U.S. can be doing in this critical time before the election? All right, thank you. Um, the lady here. Uh, Marina Ottawa with the uh, Wilson Center. Um, I'd like to take you all back to the issue of ethnic federalism and the, the elections coming up and democracy. And I'm convinced that Ethiopia did not have any choice but choosing a system of ethnic federalism back then. I didn't particularly like it, but I think it was inevitable because it was the only way to keep the country together. But what really kept the country together was the fact that, that the PRDF was, it's like the Communist Party in Yugoslavia and the Communist Party in the Soviet Union held all the regions together. If the country, if the P EPRDF uh, loses some of its grip, then particularly if the elections become more democratic, as you are all advocating, can the country stay together? Or is that at the beginning of the disintegration of Ethiopia? Thank you. And uh, we'll take one more, the, the lady there. Just further back. Uh, my name is Brahan Mengistu, a faculty member at ODU. Um, I thank all of you for serving my mother country, um, especially the two ambassadors, Sheen and Brazil, I have uh, had the opportunity to visit, and I thank you. Uh, one thing I heard that I like is the privatization idea is a bad idea, because um, for those of us who did a careful study, it was a means to transfer wealth of the nation to private hands, the first one. I think we'll repeat it. The question I have um, is really, uh, Prime Minister Abiy, um, I think I understand this maybe than most people, the idea of power from the context of uh, Kenneth Balding. You may recall, some of you, uh, that power has three faces. The first one is power, threat. The second one, power is, um, is, is really exchange, kind of uh, the way Madame Brazil talked about uh, transactional, which uh, already is proven that between Eritrea and Ethiopia, we don't have much to, to do transactions, so we are stuck. And the third one, which I believe he really believes sincerely is uh, Kenneth Balding called it love, but I think respect, win-win, I think would be a good idea. My question 
for all of you and for the United States government is if my assumption, if what I'm asserting is true, that he's trying to come up with a win-win formula rather than I win, you lose, what is that this government is ready to do? What can you do as ambassadors to help influence policy, to help him make, become successful? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so let's uh, take that first round, and then we'll come back to the audience again. Uh, perhaps we can start with the question of the next 12 to 18 months. I mean, this is, of course, the question that we're always asking. We stayed away from it until now for this reason, so we could set the, the foundation. But maybe, uh, David Chin, if I could ask you to, to respond to that. What do you think should happen um, in the next 12 to 18 months? Yeah, this is obviously a real challenge for... Um, for Abi, uh, Prime Minister Abi, and, and, and the, the people around him. Uh, in terms of what the United States might do, and, and trying to keep it realistic, I mean, we, let's face it, we're, we're dealing with a policy towards Africa where there's not an enormous amount of interest in, in Washington. Uh, so one can pontificate about all the kind of stuff we should be doing, but I'm not sure it's worth my yeah. Pontificating so what's because, realistic? So yeah. Because it isn't going to happen. Yeah. Uh, uh, there are things that can be done with the limited resources that we seem to be, uh, uh, we, we seem to still have. And that is essentially uh, supporting those kinds of institutions, both financially and with just plain exhortatory and moral support, uh, such as keeping the press as free and as open as possible hoping that it will also be a, resp a responsible press. Sometimes the press is not always responsible, but uh, hope springs eternal. Uh, working with the, the Electoral Commission in uh, Ethiopia, and I gather all kinds of foreign countries have offered to support the Electoral Commission, uh, and to ensure that you have a commission that when you do have elections, and I, as I said earlier, I'm not committed to the fact that you have to have it in 2020. It may have to be postponed. Um, but keeping the Electoral Commission as, as uh, honest and as uh, open and uh, as unbiased as can possibly be done, moving forward as quickly as possible with the census. It's just awfully hard to do a really valid election without an up-to-date census. The last one was 2007. It's hopelessly out of date. And how do you even determine sort of where your, where your voting power is in the country? Uh, encouraging the uh, support of civil so of Ethiopian, particularly, uh, civil society organizations. Now, I think all of these things Abi is interested in doing and willing to do, uh, and I think the U.S. can be helpful in this regard in, in uh, concert with partners, mainly the European Union. But um, these are still relatively small contributions uh, to the problem. It, it, in the final analysis, it's an Ethiopian got to be an Ethiopian fix. Right. Ambassador Brazil, I'm sure you agree with that also, that it has to be an Ethiopian fix, but do you see additional things that the United States should contemplate in the next 12 to 18 months period? Well, I agree with everything Ambassador Shen said, and I would add uh, um, something to do with the diaspora. Mm -hmm. The diaspora has a huge uh, influence in Ethiopia because their families there and they can influence. And money. Uh, and money, for sure. Uh, and since uh, the Prime Minister sort of um, reconciled with the, with the diaspora, I think there's, a, there's an opportunity there. Exactly what, I'm not sure, because it has to be Ethiopian made, not American made. Uh, but I think there's opportunity and money there that could influence uh, preparations and openness to uh, in the electoral process. Uh, Ambassador Barson Booth, perhaps I can ask you to respond to this question about ethnic federalism and is the country facing a collapse if it isn't organized in that way? It's Marina, Marina Ottaway's question here. <laughs> yeah, well, I think uh, you've heard my view, which is I think ethnic federalism is probably the the best system they have now. I think that what they ought to focus on um, is trying to kind of fix it and make it more palatable and more desirable to more people in, in the country. Uh, 
um, you know, end the monopoly of any one ethnic group over any particular part of the economy, over the security services, uh, over any particular ministry. Um, they might look at, you know, right now it's a it's a federal system, but it's really a centralized system because it's the party controls governmentally federal effectively centralized system. So make it really more of a federal system, effectively, um, where perhaps the local parties that come out on top in their regions uh, really do have more autonomy and control. I mean, the other thing about federalism is until a federal entity can truly raise revenue and tax its people, uh, it's never really going to have autonomy from the center. So that's maybe something else that should be considered. Uh, as a way of really empowering each of the regions. Um, but at the same time, it's very important that this notion of Ethiopianness uh, be built up and be stressed so that if you do have more autonomous uh, regions under a federal structure, that's not licensed to say, well, you're not from this ethnic group, so get out of our region. And to, and to atomize the country along ethnic lines. So I think it's a two-pronged approach. The leadership at the top needs to be emphasizing we're all Ethiopians together, but we do have our uniqueness, and we're going to allow people to, to express and experience their uniqueness to a greater degree uh, than in the past. Uh, I know that's a, sort of a wishy-washy answer, but I think you know there's no there's no cookie cutter response that, that really fits. And ultimately, as we've all been saying, it's the Ethiopians who are going to have to decide <clears throat> what that solution is. Um, I agree with that, and I really don't have a lot to add. But I, I would just say that I think we, we, not we, the Ethiopians need to be very, very careful. Because to come to your point, I think for all its failures, um, the system has prevented most terrible, uh, out, the most terrible outcomes that one can imagine. And, and I think it's not bad for the international community to, to, to stress um, that, okay, we understand this isn't perfect, we understand there ought to be changes and so on and so forth, but let's not sort of rush into some other system that leads leads to Oromos fighting Amharas and who are fighting Tigrayans, who are fighting, you know, whomever else. Because that, that's not good for Ethiopia and it's certainly not good for the international community uh, either. Uh, would anyone like to respond to the professor's question about your own personal um, roles moving forward, or shall we go to take another round? Feel free if anyone has anything they'd like to add to that. We're all has been. Exactly. <laughs> we might have muscle memory, but we don't have any uh, <laughs> any current role. All right, thanks. Uh, Ali, Ali, can yes, I just do two yes, fingers on please. the first question, yes. which is what the U.S. can do? Okay. I think one of the critical things is um, don't let hubris take hold. Let's be modest and realistic and not overpromise what we can do to help. Yeah. Thanks for that uh, helpful reminder. Let's take a few more questions. Um, so we have the, the man in the back there. Good afternoon. My name is Robert Bowman. I'm with the U.S. Department of Justice. I'm the Regional Director for Africa, overseeing some of the capacity building programs in Africa. I had the pleasure of living in Addis 2006-2008. My wife worked at PACT, the USAID-funded program for democracy and governance. Had the opportunity since then to be overseeing some of the programs in Ethiopia, and just went back in December to do an assessment tour to see what the USG should be providing. Quickly, I'll say Ambassador Rayner and his team has done a fabulous job trying to get the USG to turn uh, to turn its attention in a, in a more directed fashion and with more resources. My question is. Specifically, going back to the question that I asked earlier, what we can be doing, based upon your historical knowledge and your knowledge about what's going on in Ethiopia now, what is it within the justice sector that you would suggest should be what institutions and what priorities should be addressed? That's certainly the question that we were asked in, in the assessment. One very quick observation that goes back to the, the, how this panel started on 
um, this Ethiopia being on a knife edge. One thing that was struck me during the assessment and going around and meeting the leadership of all the various uh, ministries was how young the people were that were now in place, uh, supposedly in the leadership of running these institutions, and you compare that to the opposition, the spoilers, with their years of uh, running things, I, I found that very um, surprising or um, concerning. But anyway, back to the question is really about justice sector yes. and what and what the folk, what your focus would be, knowing what you know. Thank, Thank you. you for the free advice to the DOJ. So, okay, we'll have a, uh, the gentleman here. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jerry Jones. I'm happily retired. Um, I'm curious if during your individual ten years, in your interface with Ethiopian authorities. Did you find the annual State Department's Human Rights Report and Voice of America to be of no consequence, to be harmful, to be helpful, or what was the, uh, or maybe it never came up? Thank you. There's a gentleman right in the back there. This one in the front. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Gutu Wayesa. I'm affiliated with University of Helsinki in Finland, and. American University in DC. My question is, as we think of framing the problems to look for the way to help, we need to frame it uh, rightly. And I need to raise a concern about the ongoing displacement attributed entirely to ethnic conflicts. Would it be fair to mention it as entirely caused by ethnic differences and describe it as ethnic conflicts? Uh, this has broad implications, and I would like to uh, see your reflection, because I see a complex set of causes actually driving the current state of affairs. And the same goes into the way we understand the implications of ethnic federalism. Did it fail uh, entirely? Did it work in some ways? Did it fail where it failed because it is organized in that way? or? Was it, did it fail because it was not implemented in the way it should have been implemented in the first place? In the absence of entirely fair shared rule and fair um, self-rule, in the absence of democracy, how did we expect to work it better than this? Right, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for your question. And we'll take one more. There's the, the lady right there. Hi, um, I'm Julie Stewart. I'm an intern at the Africa Society. Um, I was just wondering, I feel like I got a well-rounded like number of statements about how the U.S. feels about what's going on in Ethiopia right now. Um, but I was wondering if you guys knew anything about how Ethiopians on the ground are feeling about all of these reforms. Thank you for that. Um, so we have the question about justice. What could be done in the justice sector? Any, any thoughts? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to comment on that. Uh, we actually had, during my time in Ethiopia, a very active program uh, funded by USAID to try to develop the uh, judicial sector of Ethiopia. I thought it was one of our better programs. Uh, I probably misjudged that to some extent because I'm not sure I fully understood the degree to which the uh, judicial sector was a tool of the executive branch in Ethiopia at the time. In other words, we were training judges, we were training prosecutors. I, I thought this was all great stuff. And these were young people, uh, up and comers, and hopefully they are now in a position where they actually can, can be independent uh, judges and prosecutors uh, under, under the uh, Abiy Ahmed uh, government. But unfortunately, during the time that I was there, it never really was able to break out of the control of the executive branch and become a truly independent judiciary. And the program ended, uh, I don't know, a couple of years after I left, I believe. I know it came to a, a, a halt at some point in time. But it was a good program, and it's probably the kind of program that ought to be looked at right now to see if this isn't the time to revive this sort of program uh, so that you can have a more independent judiciary. Do you want to, can you can carry on with the Voice of America? Yeah, yeah right good question point. For uh, your time? In, in, a, in sort of a good way, the, the day that the, the annual Human Rights Report came out was always one of the worst days of my life in Ethiopia. 
because I, you could be assured that I was going to get called in by either Mellis or somebody else and hammered for what the hell are you allowing to happen now? I mean, we're, you're criticizing us, it's all wrong, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but this was one way that we could get the word out, and it would not necessarily be attributed to me individually uh, as the person getting the word out. Yeah, but those reports were done very carefully. They were done in concert with the embassy. The embassy didn't always agree with 100% of what was in them, uh, but they were negotiated reports between Washington and, um, and, and uh, Addis Ababa, as they are with other posts around the world. And they were they're very important reports, and governments, I think, do read them, do pay attention to them. They do serve a purpose, and uh, I, I was, uh, was always in favor of them, in spite of the fact that it made some very difficult days for me, at least one day out of the year, a couple days out of the year. Same with Voice of America. I'm a strong believer in Voice of America. Sometimes Voice of America would get a little off track uh, in that you would get uh, some particularly Ethiopian-American commentators who might go a little bit over the edge on a few things, uh, totally irritating the government, and, and sometimes justifiably so. But then the reaction from the government was so heavy-handed that it's to be almost bizarre, uh, shutting down uh, uh, the service, uh, the, uh, I, I believe it was the Amharic service that was shut down on a number of occasions to Ethiopia. This is totally uncalled for, uh, heavy-handed, unnecessary, yeah, even if mistakes are occasionally made uh, by Voice of America, which they probably will be. Uh, but I, I I think it's a, it's a very important institution in Washington to maintain. Uh, Ambassador Brazil, on the Human Rights Reports, the question was also, did they make a difference? And what's your, what's your view on that? I think, I think they made a difference. I think it uh, got information out um, uh, to the general American uh, and international communities, mm -hmm. as well as to uh, people in Ethiopia. Uh, perhaps because I was a woman, I didn't get as strong a pushback uh, we got pushed back, mm -hmm. but I like to think that the reports during the, my time there were very honest and very uh, comprehensive. Um, we pushed back on any allegations that we were not, we were just simply updating what had been done before and we weren't, uh, you know, cleaning out old information and that kind of thing. We made an effort to uh, actually go and talk to the government agencies responsible for whatever it was we were writing up. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, there was some pushback, but not, I don't recall being particularly perturbed by it. Yeah. Ambassador Booth, can I ask you to respond to this, this question about displacement? This is the, the current situation. Is it fair to say it's all the result of ethnic problems? Are there other causes to it? Are there other factors that explain it? My understanding is the, the displacement that we've seen, the, the the three percent of the population that I mentioned are now driven from their homes really is uh, it, it's it's ethnic um, but I've also been told that it's basically political leaders using the ethnic card to boost their own uh, prestige and popularity uh, you know you get right people riled up I'm here to defend your interests against the other and uh, I think that's what we've seen in Ethiopia. I did hear when I was out there that the federal government's response was an edict that everybody should just go back to where they came from, uh, i.e. if you were displaced, go back to where you were displaced from. That's nice to say, but very hard to actually implement. Why would people go back if they were driven out of their home? How would they feel safe there? If their home was burned, who was going to help them rebuild it? So, uh, you know, there's a conundrum there. And, and I don't think that um, this displacement issue is going to be settled until the broader political structural issues are, are settled in the country. And perhaps I can ask you to continue from there about the views of the Ethiopians you interacted with on reform. So you were just there. How did they see it as... Yeah. as well, I think it's a matter of, you you know, you see it from where you sit. Uh, if you're sitting up in Tigray, you think this is not particularly good development, that the country is degenerating into lawlessness and chaos, the economy is collapsing. Um, if you're sitting uh, in Oromia, you're breathing a bit of a sigh of relief that we now uh, have our rightful place, we have some power. Um, you know, I think Prime Minister Abe, as he was described, is still by far the most popular person in the country, uh, but that, that popularity is beginning to wane the longer he's in charge. Um, and I would say one of the real challenges that he faces is there are rising expectations in Ethiopia now. 
And one thing I do remember from uh, Political Science 101 is that uh, revolutions only occur in situations where there are rising expectations. So he has a lot of work to do if he's going to keep the country together, find that sweet spot of you know, what works uh, governmentally-wise, structurally, federal, centralized, what combination, uh, what combination between government and party going forward. I think that's also a key structural issue that needs to be addressed. Um, so, again, it's, you know, where you are, it depends on how you see the developments. Unfortunately, we're at time. I want to, okay, I'll give you the last I, word. Yeah. Uh, back to the justice yes. question. I think that uh, some of our efforts could be aimed at um, uh, concentration. How do you diffuse ethnic tensions? How, how do people get a fair shake in the courts uh, or in some, some setup uh, that would maybe reassure people? So I just throw that out. Just real quickly on the ethnicity question, uh, I would simply add that uh, it's not uniquely a question of ethnicity. The whole land issue is, is a very important element of this, uh, which is related, obviously, to ethnicity. But uh, it's a far more complex question than just ethnicity. And the land is also a place where the justice uh, question intersects once more. Um, of course, is the problem with these kind of panels, just when you get it going. It's time to end, unfortunately, but I'm really um, glad and very grateful to all of you, Master David Shin, Aurelia Brazil, Mark Bass, and Donald Booth for your uh, remarks and for your patience. Um, Susan Staganta, our Africa director, will just say a few final thoughts. Thanks. Um, thank you, Ali. Um, I have the nice job to be able to say thank you to our panelists and thank you to all of you for joining us. I also have the benefit that nobody will ask me any questions on what I'm, what I'm about to say. Um, but listening to the remarks today um, took me back to a discussion we had several years ago talking about transitions. Um, and transitions in countries that are ready for transition and transitions in countries that aren't ready um, and ro what role the U.S. and diplomatic engagement can play in that. And I think listening today, it's, it's clear that transitions are incredibly difficult. There are issues of the immediate moment that have to be addressed. There are issues of the past that have to be addressed. And each of those take challenging negotiations along the way. And diplomatic representatives play a critical role in that. Um, we tend to think about the transition in Ethiopia, I think, in the last year term. And what I really appreciate today is to put that into the context of the various points of transition of the country um, and the relationship that the United States has had now for over 120 years. Um, and the strategic nature of that relationship going forward. Um, so I, I remember in that, that conversation a couple of years ago, we were talking about the role of external partners of helping to hold up a mirror um, as, as some of these transitions are taking place. And I think that's, that's true in capitals, but also true at the regional level and at the community level. Um, so let me, let me thank our, our excellent panelists for sharing their experiences. Ali, thank you for asking difficult questions and keeping the conversation honest and genuine. Um, and let me thank all of you for your interest Trust, uh, I think, in a country, uh, when we look at Ethiopia, one in 12 Africans is Ethiopian. And what we're seeing take place in that country, I think, deserves the attention that, that fills the room today um, and the deep experience that our panelists have brought. So thank you very much. Please join me in thanking them.